In the fictional game we're playing, characters take on all the attributes of people, if they're people. And even sometimes when they're not, language is one of our main features. People talk to one another a lot. Really, Ro, you don't say. I know, here I go, stating the obvious again. But what's not so obvious, especially for newer writers, is figuring out how characters should talk to one another. Not surprisingly, I have a slightly different take from the average fiction writing guide out there. The main reason for that, on this front, is that I take the fiction game seriously. But not quite literally, because that would spoil the game. But I'm going to get pretty close to literal in the way I talk about dialogue, and that's because I'm still giving the role of the narrator its properly prominent place. What am I getting at? It's just a difference in conceptualization. We only think characters talk to each other. They don't. Characters don't speak at all. Only the narrator speaks. What readers perceive as characters speaking is actually the narrator's representation of their speech. I'm not sure this is a game-changer in terms of helping the writer get the character's speech across to the reader more clearly, but I'm also not convinced it's insignificant. When you write with this in mind, I think it's easier to embrace the artifice. I'll talk quite a bit about that in the next lesson, but for now, we'll just be talking about the actual nuts and bolts of representing speech on the page for the reader. There aren't too many ways to do this, and you're probably already well familiar with at least two of these ways, so let's dig in. Direct Discourse The first and commonest way of representing a character's speech is called direct discourse, so named because the convention of the fictional game has it that this form of utterance is the character's speech verbatim. You all know how this part of the game gets played. You want to come for a ride, he said? Connie smirked and let her hair fall loose over one shoulder. Don't you like my car? New paint job, he said. Hey, what? You're cute. She pretended to fidget, chasing flies away from the door. Don't you believe me or what? He said. Look, I don't even know who you are, Connie said in disgust. This is a snippet from Joyce Carol Oates' short story, Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been? A couple of things to notice in this dialogue are the unconventional contraction of don'tcha and the conflating of want to into wanta. Oates is doing this to capture the idiolect of teenagers to a very specific purpose. The male speaker in this passage isn't a teenager himself, but an older guy who hangs around with teenagers, trying to pass himself off as one of them. He's actually a dangerous predator but this narrator very skillfully portrays the direct and calculated way he addresses his victim. It seems like it might just be an innocuous, clunky discussion between teenagers. Not so. We'll talk a bit more about idiolect in the next lesson, because it's a potential pitfall if done poorly. But for now, we'll just mention a few more nuts and bolts things about direct discourse before moving on. A dialogue tag the part of speech representation that assigns a speaker, usually he said or she said, etc., has a few other useful functions beyond simply letting the reader know who said what. We'll take a closer look at the third sentence in that passage again. Don't you like my car? New paint job, he said. Hey. The narrator can put the dialogue tag anywhere here, before the first sentence, after the question mark, at the very end but it's after the second utterance. This isn't arbitrary. The tag is functioning to separate two different types of speech, the first that conveys information about his car, and the second a direct call to elicit a response from Connie. These are two very different ideas that would run together if they weren't separated by the tag. Listen to what it would look like with the tag elsewhere. Don't you like my car? New paint job, hey, he said. Or. Don't you like my car, he said. New paint job, hey. Both sound a little ridiculous, right? The tag in the original is doing important work. It's an idea separator. It's conveying basic information about who's speaking, but it's also separating one type of utterance from another. This is a skill good writers use to help their dialogue flow more naturally. Learn to do this, and it will sharpen the dialogue in your fiction. You can also notice a few other useful things from just this brief passage 
that convey information beyond the words in the dialogue itself. You want to come for a ride, he said. Connie smirked and let her hair fall loose over one shoulder. Don't you like my car? New paint job, he said. Hey. Note how the narrator responds to the guy's question with a description of Connie's body language. It's almost as good as a line of dialogue itself. It tells the reader two things, that her body language is dismissive and that she doesn't really want to talk to this guy, otherwise she'd answer him directly. Oates's narrator does this twice, just in this brief passage. When he says, you're cute, the narrator informs the reader she pretended to fidget, chasing flies away from the door. This means that when the older guy presses Connie for an answer, her negative reaction is plausible and appropriate, and not at all unpredictable. Also note that only her body language is described. That's for two reasons. First, hers is more important than his. It betrays her discomfort and insecurity. And second, you already know what his body language is, don't you? A reader can infer from his speech and her reaction that he's pushy. And a pushy person isn't a shrinking violet. The narrator doesn't need to help the reader here. That would just bog down a smoothly flowing passage. This is an example of dialogue done extremely well. It's not overcooked, seems perfectly appropriate to the characters in their story world, and it takes advantage of all the techniques good dialogue should. Correct placement of tags, proper description of the character's movement and body language to support the speech, and speech that seems believable. That's a ton of information to convey in 61 words. No wonder dialogue is such a feature of written fiction. Okay, let's look at one more of these before moving on. You should remember this one. See if you can spot some of the features Oates's narrator used so well in this passage from Raymond Carver. Hello, the man said to the girl. You found the bed. That's good. Hello, the girl said, and got up. I was just trying it out. She patted the bed. It's a pretty good bed. It's a good bed, the man said, and put down the sack, and took out the beer and the whiskey. We thought nobody was here, the boy said. We're interested in the bed, and maybe the TV, also maybe the desk. How much do you want for the bed? I was thinking fifty dollars for the bed, the man said. Would you take forty? the girl asked. I'll take forty, the man said. He took a glass out of the carton. He took the newspaper off the glass. He broke the seal on the whiskey. How about the TV? The boy said. Twenty-five. Would you take fifteen? The girl said. Fifteen's okay. I could take fifteen, the man said. The girl looked at the boy. You kids, you'll want a drink, the man said. Glasses in that box. I'm going to sit down on the sofa. The man sat on the sofa, leaned back, and stared at the boy and the girl. Carver's narrator is doing a lot of the same things as Oates's here. You can find several times where the dialogue tag is used as an idea separator. And there are quite a few cues to body language that allow the reader to infer a lot more about what's going on here than the speech alone would. But it sure seems like there's a lot of dialogue tags in this passage, right? Why would that be? Well, one important, if somewhat obvious reason for that, is that there are multiple characters in the scene. When that's the case, it becomes more important to manage the tags so that the reader knows who's saying what to whom. Carver does that in the first line of dialogue. Hello, the man said to the girl. From that point on, the reader can infer from the context who's speaking to whom. How about the TV? The boy said. 25. Would you take 15? The girl said. 15's okay. I could take 15, the man said. Dialogue is a game of call and response, just as a conversation is in real life. So the reader can infer from the context that the speaker of 25 is the man. But the questions could come from either the boy or the girl, so they must be tagged, because it's very important to the story who's asking the questions in this case. You may have noticed that the boy asks the price, and when the man responds, the girl asks if he'd take less, and he always seems to give her a lower price. The line, 15's okay, I could take 15, could similarly do without a tag and not be confusing, because it's clearly the man answering. But Carver's narrator is cueing something specific and subtle with the repetition of the words boy, girl, man, and bed in this passage. 
So if we're going to make a couple generalizations about tags that would be useful, we could say a few things. It's probably a better idea to over-attribute speech than to leave your reader wondering who said what. This is more important when there are three or more characters involved. But you don't need to tag any speech whose speaker will be obvious based on the context unless you're using the tag in a different way, like as an idea separator, a way to describe body language or actions, or for some other artistic purpose. Like with so many other conventions in fiction, there aren't any hard rules here, but convention exists for good reasons, and clever writers like Oates and Carver have found many ways to properly apply and break from convention successfully. I'll say a bit more on dialogue tags in the future lesson, but that's enough on direct discourse for the moment. Indirect discourse. The next of the three common types of speech representation is indirect discourse. Indirect discourse is the narrator's way of relating a speech event indirectly, often by way of summarizing, paraphrasing, or reporting. It's also very familiar to readers because of its common use. Sometimes indirect discourse will appear as a few words to relate a long conversation, or as a long, accurate, near transcript of the speech act. It's very useful in summarizing conversations that are important to the plot, but not dramatic enough to be shown in scene. Here's an example from the same Joyce Carol Oates story. He sat backwards on his stool, turning himself jerkily around in semicircles and then stopping and turning back again, and after a while he asked Connie if she would like something to eat. She said she would, and so she tapped her friend's arm on her way out. Her friend pulled her face up into a brave, droll look, and Connie said she would meet her at eleven, across the way. There isn't a ton of indirect discourse in this passage, but it's there. Did you catch the three examples here? After a while, he asked Connie if she would like something to eat. She said she would. And Connie said she would meet her at eleven, across the way. This passage is conveying important information about the plot, and it's doing it in a very economical fashion. The reader doesn't need this encounter represented verbatim, because there isn't much particularly dramatic about making plans to grab a burger. But it does tell the reader about the plans Connie is making to leave her friend to go grab something to eat with a boy. This is a different boy from the first passage, by the way. Here the narrator is doing more useful work with the description of the characters than the dialogue would do here. It's a wonderful representation of the kind of clumsy awkwardness of teenagers feeling each other out socially and sexually. The boy nervously swiveling on a stool, screwing up the courage to ask Connie to eat with him, and Connie's friend's quirky supportive look when she says yes. This is a great example of knowing when to summarize the unimportant speech while providing the important characterizing details in summary. This speech representation isn't as immersive as direct discourse, but this brief passage demonstrates the utility of varying distance, pulling back to give a reader a wider view and then moving in when it counts most. Free indirect discourse. The last of the three main speech representations in fiction is called free indirect discourse. This isn't a representation of speech, strictly speaking. It's more a representation of a character's thoughts, but it's not too dissimilar from speech, so it often gets lumped together when talking about speech representation. I'll show you why. Let's start with an example first and work from that to explain what's going on. More from Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been? And for those watching the YouTube version, I've italicized the free and direct discourse. She was a secretary in the high school Connie attended, and if that wasn't bad enough, with her in the same building, she was so plain and chunky and steady that Connie had to hear her praised all the time by her mother and her mother's sisters. June did this. June did that. She saved money and helped clean the house and cooked, and Connie couldn't do a thing. Her mind was all filled with trashy daydreams. So what's going on here? We have a non-character narrator talking about Connie and her sister. If we pay attention to some of these specific parts, you may notice that they're a little different from the normal mode of the straight narrator telling the story in a strictly conventional manner. Essentially, what Oates' narrator is doing here, you might consider a psychic channeling of Connie, 
it's as though Connie's idiolect is leaking into the narrator's style of narration. Some of the things typically portrayed with free and direct discourse are idiolects, biases, opinions, and thoughts that are clearly the characters and not the narrators. You could almost hear Connie saying, June did this, June did that, and the phrases chunky and steady and filled with trashy daydreams are thoughts one can easily imagine Connie having while describing June. The straight-laced narrator, not so much. Free and direct discourse is a method of narration that attempts to bridge the gap between a character narrator and a non-character narrator in order to capture the beneficial points of both styles. With free and direct discourse, you get the psychological insight and idiolect common to a character narrator. But you can also claim some of the authority that goes along with being a dispassionate external narrator, uncorrupted by the character's bias. If the narrator is expert at it, see Morrison, Tony, a mercy. The story can also jump into and out of many characters' heads without skipping a beat. Strictly speaking, free and direct discourse is a representation of thought, not speech. But it is a way that the narrator speaks for the character. It's a bridge halfway between speech and thought, seemingly. Often, early 20th century modernist writers get credited for this innovation because they were the first to use it widely as a feature of their era's style. I've seen chunks of it in Melville and Jane Austen, and no doubt it goes back even further. But if you're looking to see it done well over a longer text, you could also check out Edith Wharton, James Joyce, and Virginia Woolf. Direct Thought So that's halfway between thought and speech. Let's take a look at how to portray thought a bit more directly for comparison. I guess you could call this mode of narration direct thought. Here's Michael Crichton's narrator in Jurassic Park. This damn storm, he thought. It might screw up everything, because if Dodgson's boat wasn't waiting for him at the East Dock when Nedry got there, the whole plan would be ruined. Nedry couldn't wait very long, or he would be missed back at the control room. The whole idea behind the plan was that he could drive to the East Dock, drop off the embryos, and be back in a few minutes before anyone noticed. In short, Nedry'd thought of everything, except this damn storm. That's about as functional representation of a character's thoughts as a narrator can present. A simple bit of free and direct discourse to cue the individual character's thoughts, this damn storm. This is followed by a tag to make sure the reader knows what follows is the character's line of thinking, and not the narrator's. He thought. Then the passage follows as though the narrator is translating the character's thoughts directly onto the page. The thoughts are clear, linear, and orderly, with none of the jumping about that you'll get from pure representations of thoughts. If your goal is to convey clearly to the reader the important things going on in your character's head, you can't do it much more cleanly than this. X, Y, Z, she thought. No muss, no fuss just a clear picture of what's important to the character at that moment. That's the clean end of the thinking spectrum. At the polar opposite of this spectrum is a fun little narrative technique called stream of consciousness. You've probably heard of this technique, if not read some of it at some point. Arguably the most famous passage of stream of consciousness comes from Molly Bloom's soliloquy in James Joyce's novel Ulysses. In it, the narrator dispenses with many of the narrative conventions readers rely on for clarity in favor of a steady stream of words that the reader hopefully interprets as the character's unfiltered inner voice. In Gibraltar as a girl, where I was a flower of the mountain, yes, when I put the rose in my hair like the Andalusian girls used, or shall I wear a red, yes, and how he kissed me under the Moorish wall, and I thought well as well him as another, and then asked him with my eyes to ask again yes, and then he asked me would I say yes to say yes, my mountain flower, and I first put my arms around him, and drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts all perfume, yes, and his heart was going like mad, and yes, I said yes, I will, yes. The goal with a presentation like this is to capture as realistic a portrayal of the character's psyche as is possible to put to the page. This mode of narration, if it's done well, can convey a character's stream of thought accurately. It presents obvious drawbacks as well. The most obvious one is that it can trip up the reader, 
because they'll have to work to parse the language into coherent sentences. Joyce even goes to the extreme of removing all the punctuation marks, im instead of im, for example. To parse the words on the page and make sense of them takes cognitive capital, and it makes the artifice of the book and the narrative technique prominent. So though this technique would seem to offer a high immersive value, there's a necessary period where the reader must adapt to the style of narration. Whatever realism that may be gained in representing thoughts accurately is likely to be traded off in the reader's struggle to actually read the text. This isn't to say that this is a bad literary move. It certainly worked for Joyce and many others. Another issue with stream of consciousness is that in order to narrate a stream of consciousness believably, it needs to jump about realistically. Structuring the thoughts too rigidly may give the reader the sense that the stream of consciousness is not believable. This means that bits of information that have no bearing on the story will necessarily be in the story to add a sense of realism to the narrative style. In essence, over a prolonged period, it could make for a story that isn't as well structured as a story with a different narrative style. The non sequiturs and bits of information that aren't plot related make for a story that may seem realistic but less story-like. This has the potential to divert a reader's attention and have them off wandering in their own stream of consciousness and not your books. And if that's the effect you're going for, then great. But it's important to understand that with this technique, as with all literary techniques, the narrator is balancing a set of trade-offs. There is no perfectly immersive way to represent thoughts or speech on the page, and the pros and cons of all the techniques developed by novelists offer choices that better suit the telling of some stories in one case and different choices in others. Knowing the strengths and weaknesses with each representation is the key to knowing how to portray these critical elements in your story. Before closing, I feel compelled to mention a couple of important points about the narrator relating the character's thoughts, especially as it pertains to a longer passage. Free and direct discourse, direct thought, and stream of consciousness can, and often do, all fall under the umbrella of interior monologue. And yet again, I have to point to the porousness of borders. When does free and direct discourse become direct thought, become stream of consciousness? Pick up a copy of any novel by Virginia Woolf, take this question seriously, and you might just find yourself chasing your tail for the next ten years. If that's your thing, knock yourself out. To quote Norman MacLean, eventually all things merge into one, and a river runs through it. Here's a passage that merges these things into one from the vastly underread Catherine Ann Porter. This is Granny Weatherall pondering her life as she lies sick in bed, and she's sicker than she realizes. It's from the short story, The Jilting of Granny Weatherall. The pillow rose about her shoulders and pressed against her heart, and the memory was being squeezed out of it. Oh, push down the pillow, somebody. It would smother her if she tried to hold it. Such a fresh breeze blowing and such a green day with no threats in it. But he had not come just the same. What does a woman do when she has put on the white veil and set out the white cake for a man and he doesn't come? She tried to remember. No, I swear he never harmed me but in that. And what if he did? There was the day, the day, but a whirl of dark smoke rose and covered it crept up and over into the bright field where everything was planted so carefully in orderly rows. That was hell. She knew hell when she saw it. For sixty years she had prayed against remembering him, and against losing her soul in the deep pit of hell. And now the two things were mingled in one, and the thought of him was a smoky cloud from hell that moved and crept in her head when she had just got rid of Dr. Harry, and was trying to rest a minute. Wounded vanity, Ellen, said a sharp voice in the top of her mind. Don't let your wounded vanity get the upper hand of you. Plenty of girls get jilted. Now do yourself a favor and go read the rest. You can model about any representation of thought you could hope to adopt for a character from this single short story. And damn, what a short story to boot. Hey.